Maybe we'll start. Huh? Good morning to one and all present here. Let us invoke God's blessings through a small prayer. So we are the, the Stella Martitians are happy and to uh, introduce with the second uh, panel discussion uh, on educational research and statistics. People do research for different reasons. A researcher may be motivated by any one of the following reasons to fulfill an academic requirement, to solve practical problems, for enjoyment, delegation by some authority, to generate new, new theories, confirm existing ones, or disapprove the theories, to contribute to the existing body of knowledge. The quest and the curiosity to know whether uh, we achieve in doing the above made Stella Martina College of Education to arrange panel discussion like this to improve the quality of doing research and contribute theories like the one made by Piaget, Jerome Bruno, Vykotsky, and so many others. Are we really doing research to contribute to the existing theories, to come out with the new theories, or something new? Here we have the panelists. They need no introduction. Uh, we have Dr. Usha, retired professor from Calicut University. Dr. Maria, retired professor from Nirmala College, Coimbatore. And Dr. Tiago from uh, Central University of Kerala, who will share their ideas to about 10 to 15 minutes on aims and objectives 
variables and hypothesis. It is the continuation of the panel discussion series one, where we have discussed on the identification of the problem, research questions, and review of related literature. In the panel discussion series two, the participants can raise questions in the topics of aims and objectives, variables and hypothesis in the educational area. Time will be given to the research scholars and participants for raising their questions in the chat box too. So your active participation will lead the panel discussions to have an exciting and interactive one. Now I take this opportunity to thank our management, Reverend Sister Paul and Mary, our patron and secretary, our beloved principal, Dr. Joseph Cantherin, for the valuable support they render to conduct such programs. Above all, I thank God Almighty for his ever-loving guidance for the success of what we do to the cause of education. So now we ha uh, here have Dr. Maria Anita to share her valuable insights. Face new challenges. Seize new opportunities. Test your resources against the unknown. And in the process, discover your own unique potential, says John Amitch. In continuation of the identification of the problem in the panel discussion uh, series one, Dr. Maria Anita will be giving her insights on aims and objectives of research. Over to Dr. Maria Ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Alma. Now, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to speak today on aims and objectives. In the earlier, uh, we started with a, we started with the uh, series one where we were talking about generally about uh, research and the other aspects associated with the early aspects of research. Today we are going to talk about the actual research, how we are going to begin this. So coming to the research aim and objectives. I hope uh, it is visible. Is the screen visible to everybody? Yes, ma'am. But your PPT okay. is not there. Your PPT. P P PPT is uh, not there. Or empty screen only is there, white color screen. OK. Trying to open your PPT and that's it. Yes, it's coming, ma'am. It is okay. Now it's okay. okay. Now, I'd like to tell that the first thing in research is what we call as aim. So, aim is actually something not only in research, but what we can also do during in our daily life. We aim at a lot of things. For example, instead of taking up uh, to explain about aims and objectives in research, I just want to tell you what is aims and objectives in life so that we can understand it in research. Because when we talk about research, everybody has a habit of getting very uh, scared or hassled about it. But in simple terms, aim is something like using a camera. And today, all of us are having a mobile phone and we use the camera. And we have to direct it at our target and click. So the target is the goal that we are trying to get a photo of. 
and we are clicking. So how do we take a photo of a, our target? For example, your, your graduation day, you'd like to have a photo of you receiving your degree from a VIP or a vice chancellor or so on. So unless we aim the, the lens at the target, we will not get the right picture. So we have to aim correctly. And we have to aim it so precisely and follow the points behind this, such as clicking, et cetera, so that we get a very good picture. So it's only by the direct aiming that we are able to get or reach the target. So aim on a research is like using a camera or a missile or a weapon, or even like in any sports, for example, in football, you want to reach the goal, you have to aim at the goal and kick the ball. So if you are going to kick it in another direction, we cannot just uh, enjoy the feeling that we have reached the goal unless it reaches the goal. So our sight should always be on the goal that we are trying to work on. That is in research, what exactly you want. And this goal is normally given as the research question. And we have to aim in such a way that we achieve the desired outcome. You can have an outcome, but it is not always a desired outcome. A desired an outcome is clicking any photo. So you just aim and you shoot. You get a photo of something on screen, on somebody on the stage, or even somebody else. But in order to get your photo, that is when you are receiving your degree from the uh, vice chancellor, then you have to be very careful about the timing and how you are uh, focusing on that, the time of clicking correctly, the point where you are standing. If you stand too far away, you will get a very small photograph. If you stand very close, you may get only half of it. So the distance between the goal. So all these are factors where you get a desired outcome. Now, coming to what exactly is this aim? So normally, when we talk about research aim, in simple words, we say, what are you doing? So in research, what are you doing? So I'm trying to find out whether students' behavior during the pandemic. I'm trying to find out what is their behavior of uh, primary school children during the pandemic, or what is the attitude of teachers when they have been asked to take uh, online classes from one to one class. So it's just an asking somebody, what are you doing? Even more simply, I can explain. When, when you go home, you ask your mother or someone, whoever is at home, what are you cooking? So she will explain to you, I am making a lunch for you, which is a very broad, uh, just a general idea. So you don't know what exactly you are going to get lunch, but you don't know what lunch you're going to get. So it's a very broad answer. It's a broad. But if your mother tells you, I am making paneer biryani for you and with some raita, then you understand that it is a very specific way of explaining your aim. So you understand that your mother's aim is to prepare a particular paneer pulao or paneer biryani for you. So that is the aim of what they are doing. When we talk about a research objective, it is in simple words telling, how are you going to do it? So you are asking a researcher, what are you doing in research? And then the next one follows, how are you going to do it? So how are you going to do it? So you have, how are you going to do it is involves number of steps. What are you doing is just one factor. That is, you're going to reach something. You want something. You're going to make something. You're going to create something. You're going to analyze something. So that is one aspect. That is what are you going to do, your end goal or your end result. But a research objective is how are you going to do it? So when you say how are you going to do it, it involves steps. <clears throat> so research objectives involves many steps. So you go step by step. And when we are talking about that step, it will not. you cannot jump from one step to another. You have to go gradually from the first step onwards, little by little. So a research aim and objectives, both are <clears throat> very important in research. They help you to determine the direction of research, the importance of research, 
It also tries to tell you what is the value of your research, how much you're going to use it for the society, etc. <clears throat> Therefore, it is very important how you formulate your research aim and objectives. What is the quality of the aim in research when we are talking about aim? What should its quality be? What should its characteristic be? A research aim is actually a statement. We are making a statement in research. Now, I gave you an example of preparing paneer pulao and all that is for you to understand. But in research, when we are talking about an aim, it is a statement. And that statement tells you what your intentions are in research. What do you intend to do in your research? So it is the focal point of your research. So the most important fulcrum or focus of your research is your aim. And normally, it is from there that you start working. Because unless you know what you want to do, you don't know how you're going to do it. So unless you know where the goal is, you don't know how you're going to kick the ball. Unless you don't know who you want to click and take a photograph of, you will be just clicking anybody and everybody. So you need the aim is the focus or the starting point of your study. Once your aim is very clear, then your research becomes smooth. Because from that aim, you are able to go step by step in the process of how, what, when, where. And that, that, is, that are the objectives that you have framed. Then you will go through research questions you have to answer. For that, you will have to understand all the variables, the independent and the independent variables. So you become very clear about what you're trying to find out. And once you're very clear, you know what kind of data you need, where you're going to go and collect it. So what are the sources for it? Is it primary or secondary? And after collecting of data, you have already planned for these kind of data and variables. What is the method you're going to use? What are the tools you're going to use? What are the sampling you're going to use for collection of data? And then what are the tools you're going to use to analyze the data? And then finally, you arrive at your results. And that results, if it matches the goal, then your research is fantastic. You have reached your goal correctly. You have aimed correctly. You have moved step by step correctly. But if at the end, your result does not give you exactly what you started looking for, but it, you end up doing something else. Like, for example, you start with paneer pulao and you land up with paneer masala, then your aim is not correct. Somewhere you are wrong. Either you have aimed wrong or your, your steps or objectives that, you have, that has led you to the result was all wrong. Therefore, it is OK. You still you have time. You can go back and refine your aims. So an aim and objective is very, very important. So what are the points you, which, is, which you have to make a note of while framing an aim? You have to be very clear about your intention or your idea, the final goal that you want to reach. What is it that you want to achieve? That has to be very clear in the mind of the researcher before they start the research. So that is why in the previous series, we were talking about <clears throat> what are the, the literature collection or the review of literature. So normally, when we are reviewing literature, and if you understand the types of uh, research, you will be able to find out, or you will be having a very clear idea about your intentions. And as I told you, the aim should always be in the form of a sentence. It should be a very clear sentence, and the language should be very good. That is, it should be articulated very well. The sentence framing should be done very, very clearly. It may be just one sentence, but you have to take a lot of time in framing that sentence that is called as an aim. So there should be no grammatical errors. There should be no half sentences or incomplete sentences. It should be written very, very clearly. So anytime you look at the aim or anybody else who's not doing research, when they read your aim, they should be very clear about what your research is all about. So it should be well explained, and your aim should be very specific. Normally, it is one single sentence. It can be a long sentence, but preferably, it is one sentence. But in some cases, there may be conditions where you may have to split your sentence into two parts. Or sometimes, if you have very exhaustive research where you have two or three things that you are going to compare, etc., then you may have to have 
two or three aims. But a, a study with more than three aims will not uh, is not a feasible study. So normally keep your aim as only one and at the most in two parts or as two aims. Don't go for more aims because you need more uh, objectives and your study will get more complicated. If you have two aims or more, then you should, those aims should be very logically related and they should be also logically sequenced. So what you should avoid when formulating the aims, don't choose very broad areas of research. For example, uh, if I just uh, talk about the health of teachers in Tamil Nadu during the pandemic, it is a very broad area. We don't know which other teachers you're talking about. Is it for the whole of Tamil Nadu, for all the school teachers, right from primary, middle and high school, for the government schools, for the uh, private schools? So it's too broad an area. We don't know how we are going to. So you have to narrow it down. You can narrow that topic down and say to understand the health issues faced by higher secondary school teachers in Chennai. Or you can make it as to understand the health uh, the health problems faced by higher secondary school teachers in chennai who are who fall in the age group of 40 to 60 years and who are working in the private schools so you are narrowing down your aim in such a way that you know clearly now you're going to target only teachers who are above 40 years who are working only in private schools in chennai so they are all senior teachers. They have been doing the teaching work for a long time. Therefore, you expect them to have certain problems like diabetes or blood pressure or cause due to stress or varicose veins cause due to standing. So there can be so many reasons for when a teacher is teaching for many long years. So they may confront a lot of health issues. So you already have an idea, but you want to check it. You want to test it and you want to find and prove that what you have, the idea that you have is correct. You should not go in for an unrealistic aim. That is, if you are aiming for something which you know that you are not going to get data for. So in the last one, I was explaining about uh, data on accidents. We don't get data very easily in our country from the police department. Sometimes we don't get confidential data. So if you're going to do work which involves such kind of data collection, or supposing your work is so huge that it may take 10 years or seven years and your research timing given for you is just three years, it becomes very unrealistic. Or if you have to purchase number of textbooks or no, for this, or you have to pay for your data. And if you're using a very high tech software for analyzing, which costs you something in many lakhs, it becomes very unrealistic. So there is no need for a researcher who gets a stipend to go in for an unrealistic aim that may take a long time or heavy cost or data that is not available. There are so many factors. So avoid selecting unrealistic aims. So go for something that you know you can achieve. Choose a research method that is compatible. Don't go for an incompatible research methodology. So you are for a technology, a computer software for analyzing your information. Don't go for something that is very, very expensive. So maybe an institution go for it. But as an individual, you may not be able to go for it. If you're doing a sponsored project for the government or a non-governmental agency, you can go for it. But for an individual researcher who is trying to do an MPhil or a PhD degree, then it is better that you go for a research method that is compatible with your time, with the data available, and with cost and other factors around you. Don't go for data that is abroad. I mean, if you're comparing in for the, the teaching quality of uh, I mean, quality of teachers in India and in UK, then you may have to travel or you may have to get data, which is very, very, uh, it involves huge cost and exhaustive. It's not really something that's feasible for an ordinary researcher within in uh, a developing country like India. So try to choose a research method that is not, uh, that is incompatible. Do not go for something that is incompatible. So I've just given you some examples. I'll come back to that. Now, coming to objectives, I told you that objectives are the questions of why, who, when, how. How are you going to do it? 
Why are you doing it? Who are all the people involved in it? When is this going to happen? So you're answering all these questions through your objectives. The objectives are the steps taken to achieve your aim in a very uh, fruitful manner. Again, objectives are also statements. And these statements are very closely related to the problems. They are not statements that are not linked to the problem. They are very linked. Every objective is linked to the problem. And it also tries or highlights how your variables have chosen. What is it your dependent and independent variables? What are all the variables that will be using? And how the, you are going to bring about the relationships? So when you're talking about research objectives, you have two kinds of objectives. One we call as a major objective, or you can use the word general objective. The other ones can be told as minor objectives or specific objectives. When you say general objective, it is almost like the aim. It supports the aim very generally and gives you an objective that covers the full work. Normally, a general objective is given in one sentence. It is normally like the aim given in one sentence. And also, you normally have only one general objective. This general main objective can be divided into sub-objectives or minor objectives or specific objectives, however we take it. So they are all stated in one sentence only. And any objective, be it general or specific, major or minor, they should all be framed in such a way using action verbs, such as it should start with to identify this, to determine whether this is feasible to assess the, the amount of fees collected in schools, to describe something, to measure something, to calculate something, to verify something. So any of the action verbs are used, which, but it should be used correctly for that particular work that you're going to do through that objective. Now, the specific objectives have certain qualities. You can have more than one a specific objective or minor objectives. Normally, minor objectives, it's good that you restrict it to five or six objectives. But in educational research, sometimes the specific objectives are more in number. They go even to 10 objectives or more. But it is always best in research to restrict your objectives to five, and maybe in educational research between five to 10, not more than that. The objectives should be very clear very specific. Each objective, you should understand what is that step where it's going to lead. It should be stated in a very logical sequence. So the step that comes last should not be mentioned as the second objective. And the step that comes fifth should not go as a third objective. No, it should follow a logical sequence. They should be very realistic and achievable. Like uh, I told you about the aim on the general objective, they should be very achievable, not something unrealistic. And they also, nowadays, we call a specific objectives of smart objectives. Smart meaning uh, take the, it's an abbreviation of specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time bound. So a specific means each objective addresses only one issue. And that issue can be evaluated. So uh, yeah, I mean, what is the effect of online teaching on dyslexic children? So you can evaluate it. It's a measurable one. It is very specific. It should be attainable or feasible within your resources. It should not be something that is very cost consuming. So it should be attainable and feasible. It should be very relevant to the aim. So if the aim is about studying student behavior during pandemic, then a particular um, objective on dyslexic children is very relevant. Then time bound, it should also mention. So supposing you talk about uh, the previous example that I gave you, understanding the health conditions or health problems of higher secondary school teachers in Chennai, working in private colleges, private schools, I mean, between the age of uh, 40 and 60, in the last 20 years. So you're giving a time frame. You're not going to teachers who have been teaching 60 years back. So you're giving in the last 20 years, how has the health been for these teachers? So try to keep your uh, study 
within certain time bounds. So it is easier for you to collect information or to compare between different time periods within the major time periods. So it should be time bound. So what are the guidelines for formulating good research objectives? I, I told you earlier for specific, it, it is the same for both specific and general. They should be worded very clearly, well-defined. Sentences like for aim, it should be very clear sentences with good grammatical uh, composition. It should be complete. It should not be broken. And it should be presented briefly and concisely. It should not be written like long stories. It should be very brief, concise. It should follow a logical sequence. They should be realistic. And they should use action verbs. And the, the objective should not keep moving. When the objective changes, then your target is moving. Your goal is moving. So in research, our goals normally don't move. They are the same goals. We are trying to achieve it from different angles, maybe. But the target should not move. So we should see that our objectives are static. So they are all faced or trying to lead you or take steps or which lead you towards the same target. What is the need for research objectives? The research objectives are very essential, not only for a researcher, but even those who are evaluating the research and for those who are just having a look at your research, those who want to study your research, because it helps you to keep on that frame. It's like taking a walk. When you are just going somewhere this way and that way, then we call it as wandering. But whereas when you're taking a regular route and you're going, then we are saying you're taking a regular path. So uh, objective tries to keep you within that path or route. So it helps you to remain focused on the study. It also tells you the different steps you take in order to achieve your aim and reach your goal. It also tries to help you identify your variables and how you're going to measure it. It helps you finally to solve the problems because every step is trying to help you to solve the problem little by little. And if your goal your objectives are very clear, then it helps you uh, to avoid collecting unnecessary data. Sometimes when you don't have clear objectives, you go about collecting, I may need this, I may need this, and you'll go on collecting more and more and more data. But finally, when you come to a very clear objective and sit down to work, you feel that most of the data is useless. So when your objectives are clear in the beginning, it avoid, you can avoid collection of unnecessary data. It helps you orient your research correctly. And it also tries to tell you, this is the limits of your study. Don't go on extending your study beyond that. This is enough. You don't have to add anything more. It frames a limitation for your study. And one thing you should bear in mind is a research objective should not be considered confused with learning objectives. So in education, we have learning objectives like cognitive uh, knowledge, Affective knowledge and psychometers. That is uh, something that involves you in creating new knowledge. We say cognitive objective that uh, responds, you respond to it with feelings and emotion, becomes an effective uh, objective and helps enhance your skills and becomes a psychomotor objective. So these are all the three objectives that we normally uh, involve in learning. But research objectives can have knowledge, emotion, and skills, but they are not to be confused with the learning objectives because the research objectives are all the steps of how, why, when, and what to achieve the goal of what is it you want to do. So I think I have explained this to you at the moment, and, and I hope I have made myself clear about the aims and objectives, because they are just the simple and the starting point of research. So thank you for the space and the time given. Thank you, Dr. Alma. Thank you, ma'am, for making uh, uh, the researchers to understand through practical examples like paneer pulao and things like that. So I, I hope the researchers would have understood about uh, what are aims and objectives. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. And next, yeah. Uh, curling a says, 
the problem should express the relation between two or more variables. The most important step was to specify the research variables in the identification of the problem and define them in the operational terms. So here we have Dr. Kyahu, who would express his insights on the research variables. Kyahu, sir, you are welcome. Yes, ma'am. OK, thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much for giving the brief introduction. Uh, just I'm going to directly to the variables. Uh, so we already know what is a variable. Just I'm going to define the terms what is variable. So it's the quantity or, or conditions that can change. So if you are able to change anything during your experimentation process or during your research process, then we may treat it, that term is called as in variables. Now I'm going to focus different types of variables. The first thing I'm focusing on independent. If you uh, look on deeply about your research work, even in the uh, experimental method as well as the survey method, also we may create independent variable as well as we may select as independent variable as well as the different variable. See, this image shows the, the exact meaning of the independent. So independent variable represent a variable that can control, particularly in the context of the experimental method, uh, the variable which are able to manipulate from the invest, investigator sites, they may use the term as here independence uh, variable. That's why I'm using this term CX. So here, normally as a researcher, we are using the term X is represent for the independent variable. Y is represent for the dependent variable. The X it's called as a causing variable. So once uh, we may use the terms for the experimental method cause and the effect. In the case of cause represent independent variable, the effect represent the dependent variable. Normally the independent variable, we may use the term exposure, explanatory, as well as the manipulated variables, the different terms the people are using. Now see here, there is I'm giving some kind of examples of uh, independent variable. So in this image, you can be able to understand that, uh, what is the independent variables? This is for the experimental method I'm talking here. Um, for example, amount of water. In the context of the amount of water, the investigator can manipulate the different levels of uh, pouring the water into the plant. So for example, one person, so to, you can uh, pour the water in a little or a much or a moderate level. Like that, the investigator can decide, can manipulate the independent variable uh, to find out the, the effect of the dependent variable. The same way, the amount of fertilizers. So here, the investigator can manipulate um, based on his needs, based on the uh, what is the objectives, he may do some kind of manipulation in this. That's for is called as an independent variable. In this example, also you may easy to understand. See here, just uh, for entertaining you, I'm showing this kind of images. In this case, one person's affect, one person that called this person is beat him. So here in this context, he may be a independent variable because once the independent variable is affect the a dependent variable the, the what is it, some kind of effect you may be able to understand from the dependent variable so this is called independent now i move to the independent uh, independent the variable that we can observe or measure so this is called dependent uh, see this case the y here is represent the effect normally the role of x always to be uh, what is that causing variable? The causing of variable, it may influence or it may be affect the dependent variable. It is called measuring variable. Sometimes we may use the term as a measured variable as a dependent variable. Uh, dependent variable having the different names like outcome variables, explained variable, as well as the response variable. In this example, you can see from here, this is called effect or results. Um, so the previous example, I may talking about the independent variable, for example, amount of water here, the investigator can manipulate the pouring the amount of water into the plant. But what is the effect, the growth, the growth rate, uh, otherwise the height of the plant is called as a result or a outcome based on the independent variable. In this case, also amount of fertilizer is an independent variable that height of the plant is independent variable. But the, sometimes the, the problem with the researcher, without knowingly, they may take this kind of independent variable. So the, always we know that the independent variable should make it some kind of changes or should may having uh, should make what is it, make some kind of influence on the dependent variable. But in this case, see here, for example, this red color shirt person is maybe independent variable, but he tried to be affect the dependent variable. But in this case, the independent variable falling down. 
So better the researcher can select the proper independent variable. Otherwise, that uh, for doing the research is not be meaningful. Um, so just I'm going to highlight the different names of the independent variable as well as the dependent variable. Um, normally, we are using the term the X is represent the independent variable, otherwise causing variable, otherwise a manipulated variable. Then the general name we are using is an independent variable. In the context of the dependent variable, we are using different names, the affecting variable, measure variable, or outcome variable. Then Y represent, we also know that it is called dependent. Now, in the case of the experimental method, I'm going to be incorporate one more uh, variable that is called control variable. See, in this case, the last two example, I'm focusing on the, uh, the independent variable, like pouring the, fertilizer, pouring the water or the fertilizer amount. So that is called independent variable. In the case of dependent variable, this is called the, the growth or the, the plant height that we may treat as a dependent variable. That is called outcome also. But in the case of the experimental method, we may keep it some kind of controlled variable. Why in the sense, suppose I'm treated, um, I'm having the two planets, A and B that the port size should be different to each in, uh, each uh, port in the sense there is a chance that the growth ratio may be changed. That is why we have to keep some kind of controlled uh, things uh, while doing the experimentation. That is why we have to keep some kind of controlled uh, things. Everything you want to be remain constant and unchanging during the process of experiment, we can keep it that variable as a controlled variable. In the case of this example, type of plant as well as the pot size, amount of liquid, amount of soil type which you, you are adopting, uh, it should be a constant. It could not be manipulated from the investigator side. It should be should be a constant in nature. So that kind of variable we may treat it as a control variable in the case of experimental method. Suppose if you are taking the consideration of the third variable is that that variable may act as a different mode, like a confounding, mediating, as well as the moderating. There's a different terminology we are using when we look on to the, uh, the variable of Z. Just I'm going to show what is that is, uh, is it represent in the case of the confounding variable. So this image, you can easily understand what is the confounding. The confounding represent, so we already know that X and Y, X is independent, Y is it dependent. But in the case of the, uh, confounding variable, the both the X and Y are affected by Z. So what it means in the sense, um, in this case, the X is a house of study. I'm uh, taking some kind of example of experimental, uh, sorry, for the education examples. House of study, based on the house of study, the exam scores may be changed. This is called independent, this is a dependent way. Our subsidy is independent, the exam score is independent. But there is a chance the third variable may influence or may affect the both X and Y. That is called subject interest. So if I have the subject interest, for example, I'm the sample, if I have the subject interest of mathematics, there is a chance the house of study may increase. Parallelly, there is a chance the exam scores also may increase. So the third variable may influence or may affect the X and Y, that is called as a confounding variable. In this example, in this uh, video GIF image, you can easily understand. See here, for example, he's an X, he's an Y. So in between Z, so the Z, the Z is a factor or making some kind of influence in both an X and Y. So the same things I may quoted here, the confounding variable is a third variable. It's nothing but the Z. Uh, the independent variable and dependent variable, it may be affect with the, with the third variable. That is called confounding. That's why I'm told the Z having the different role. So the Z may be acted as a uh, confounding variable or in a extraneous variable or in a uh, intervening variable, different names are there. Just I move to the next variable that is called mediating variable. See this image, it is somewhat to be deferred compared to the, the previous uh, uh, images. In this case, X, Y, it may affect, that's who he knows. But in the case of the mediating, here that Z is acting as a mediator of X to X and Y. So what it means, a part of association between the X and Y goes through Y. So default, there is a X may influence to the Y. That's we know because our sub study may affect the exam score. But one more variable in between is acting as a moderator. That's why the our sub study for example, how of study is increasing, there is a chance the practice of problems may increase. So I am, as for example, I am the sample. 
I am studying more than ten hours. So for the more than ten hours represent uh, directly what it happened. I may do some kind of practical things much compared to the, um, the if you are taking to the consideration of the low hours of taking for the hours of study. But whilst you using the hours of study, increasing the practical problems for doing the practice also may increasing. This practical problem uh, increasing the practice may also influence the exam scores. That is called mediating variable. Here, that is it is acting as a role of mediator between the x and y. Now I'm noting the third variable, third uh, example of a zeta. So see this is called as a moderator. What is a moderator? Here the z is act as a moderator role. So it may be affect the, the association of the x and y. It won't be directly influence the x or it, it won't be directly influence the y. It may be affect the the influence it may be affect the association of the x and y only uh, for example how a subsidy is an independent variable the exam score is a dependent variable what it happened there is a chance the sample having some kind of tiredness so this may be affect uh, the exam scores too so that is called as a moderating variable in this example you can easily to understand see here for example is an x is an y so uh, here the z may stop the the two persons of fighting to each other is uh, what is like he's acting as a moderator in this example now i move to the next uh, what is called intervening variable the intervening variable it uh, what is it's like a linear um, pathway between the x and y the z is acted as a moderator only but like a linear way for example the x is i'm taking consideration level of education then is that is a third variable so if the level of education is to be uh, increased in the sense there's a chance the income level may increase if the level income is increased what is happen normally the why the spending the expenses may also increase suppose the level of ed education is low default the income is may reduce if the income is reduced what it happened finally that level of expenses also may reduce so this is called intervening variable the third variable may intervene between the two variable of x and y in this next example higher education suppose the higher education level if the higher education level is to be increased in the sense there is a chance the better occupation may get if they if the person may get the better occupations what it happened finally he may get the higher income so if you look on to the the, the negative side the higher education side is low in the sense the better occupation they won't get then finally what it happened the lower level of income they may get it so this is why the intervening variables may acting um so the, the different uh, textbook have highlighted the different kinds of uh, terminology while they're talking about the variables now i'm going to um, highlight the different uh, classification of the one more classification that is called active variable as well as the attribute variable what is an active variable variable which can be manipulated in the case of the experimental method we may use the term as a active variable for example i may take the uh, the title as a effectiveness of flipped classroom strategy on achievement so in this case flip the classroom is independent variable achievement is a dependent variable so here the investigator can manipulate the flip the classroom strategies normally the active variable should be in a independent variable it may independent variable only uh, if the investigator can able to manipulate the independent variable then we may use the term as a active variable but in the case of the attribute variable it's like a categorical variable variable which cannot be manipulated uh, for example, age, gender, some people, they may do the comparison study, um, com comparisons of rural and urban area school students infrastructure, infrastructure. So what did happen? They are comparing the two groups here. What is the independent variable? The, uh, what is that? The locality is an independent variable. He is going to measure the, uh, the infrastructure facility of the, the rural and urban schools. Therefore, in this context, the independent variable, we cannot be manipulated. Uh, so it's called like a categorical variable. Uh, even when you do for the hypothesis testing, for example, I'm doing the hypothesis testing, like there is no significant, uh, um, uh, there's no significant difference uh, between male and female in the achievement. So in this case, the male and female is acting as an independent variable. In this particular hypothesis I'm talking, then uh, achievement test may be treated as a dependent variable. So in this independent variable, which we take it for this hypothesis like male and female, it is called attribute variable. Here the investigator cannot able to manipulate, therefore it's called as a attribute variable. 
Then the next thing we know is the demographic variable. Sometimes we may use the term as a background variable. The demographic variable, as in the background variable, it, it relates to the sample. It's describing the sample only. Sometimes we may use the term as a sample characteristics. That's why I'm giving the example like age, gender, occupation, matter states, as well as the income. This may be come under the demographic variable. Normally, the demographic variable may lies on the nominal data. May lies on the nominal data. Even the um, the variable which are taking as a demographic variable, we may keep it in a different uh, terms, like a dichotomous or a binary, or trichotomous or a multiple variable. What's the dichotomous in the sense? If you are able to categorize the uh, the types of the variable into only the two classifications, then we may use the called as a dichotomous. For example, some people we may uh, divide yes or no type, so true or false. That also may come into the dichotomous or the binary. Uh, then the locality, rural, urban, pregnant, non-pregnant. So di represent two. So this similarly, there is a term is called tri trichotomous variable. It represents tri represent three. So if the investigator can divide the that uh, independent variable or the demographic variable into two, three, uh, uh, three classification like urban, semi-urban, or rural, or Hindu, Muslim, Christian, Alti, like that, if you are if he's able to classify the three classifications of the variable, then we may use the term as a trichotomous. But what is maybe multiple variable? So it means that more than three or more, so more than three or more or four, um, three or more we may treat it as a multiple variable. For example, blood groups. So we know the blood groups types A positive, B positive, B negative, AB positive, AB negative, and O. So a lot of uh, blood group types are there. Therefore, we may treat that variable as a multiple variables. Then I'm going to be highlight what is the external variable. So external variable, particularly the external variable we may use in the experimental method only. The external variable refers to any variable that you are not intensely studying. It means that while I'm doing experimentations, I want to be uh, measure that particular variable. So, for example, I'm doing the um, effectiveness of uh, flipped classroom strategy on achievement. So, in this case, uh, yeah, flipped classroom strategy is an independent variable. Achievement is a different uh, uh, a dependent variable. But there is a chance some kind of external variable level, the ICT competence of the sample, as well as the, the attitude towards of the flipped classroom, it also making some kind of influence on the the achievement, even uh, the achievement of physics or chemistry, that person very good uh, in the uh, very good. Um, what is that? This is I'm very good interest to the particular subject in the sense that kind of variable may influence the the dependent variable. So normally we are not intent to select that particular variable for measuring that kind of variable. We may treat it as external variable. Just I'm going to be highlight the example. Uh, with uh, education exam, then you may easily to understand. So that's a topic I am using here. The impact of learning format or teaching style. So I may adopt in some kind of teaching format or a teaching style I'm going to adopt. Therefore, it is called as an independent variable as a researcher. I'm going to be measure the exam performance. Therefore, it's called dependent variable. So normally, we are divide the that's uh, what is the variable into two types. One is called intention variable. What is the intention in the sense the investigator intentionally select this variable for doing the experimentation? That's called intention variable. So what is the external variable? Those variables that could also be measured, which also affect the results. But normally he don't have the intention to select the variable. That is called as an external variable. Normally, what it happened, the external variable may influence the intention variable also. That's why in the topic or which are things you are going to measure, which are things you are going to manipulate, we may treat it as an intention variable. So up to this, from this, uh, I'm giving us an example here. So from this study, the independent variable is nothing but learning format and teaching style. The dependent variable is the exam performance. That is called intentional. So the investigator intentionally selecting this variable. But what is the external variable? In the external variable, there is an independent variable as well as the dependent variable. What it means in the sense, the investigator can not having any kind of intention to select the variable, but the third variable may influence on the independent variable. So this is an independent variable, the external variable. What is mean in the sense, quality of the lecture. You are testing the teaching of style, but the teacher or the investigator not in good to deliver the particular lecture, damn sure that influence we cannot be measured in a proper manner because the this kind of variable may also influencing the the performance of the the students output 
the same relay, the dependent variable of the extraneous variable may also affect the intention variable. For example, the student tiredness. So in this student tiredness is a dependent variable of the extraneous variable. It may affect the, the dependent variable what you are going to measure that is called exam performance. For example, the student tiredness, the particular sample having the tiredness in the sun, damn sure it may be affect the exam performance. So normally this extraneous variable is nothing but the investigator not having any kind of intention to measure this particular variable, but that particular variable may affect the results. Yeah. So similarly, I'm going to give the another example with uh, uh, other uh, uh, study. The relationship between the background music, background music is a independent variable. Task performance is a dependent variable he amongst the employees at the packing facility. So the intention variable I already defined. The intention variable is the study or the variable that research want to examine. That is called intentional. The external variable means the external variable is the study or those variable that could also be measured, which also affect the results. But there is no intention the researcher to select this variable. In this case of the intentional variable, the independent variable background music, the dependent variable is task performance. But see the case of the external variable, the independent variable which affect the, the intention variable that is called type of background music, loudness of the background music, time of day for hearing the music. So you are blindly checking the background music in the intention variable. But some kind of back uh, variable, some kind of uh, hidden variable may influence the, uh, the independent variable like, uh, for example, the type of background music. Uh, so music may be um, dance based or classical or a western. So each music can make it some kind of influence in the uh, student's mindset as well the worker's mindset. The loudness of the background music, time of the day. Sometimes we may hear some music in the morning, it's good. Some music may be act for the night only. So there is a chance the time of the day of hearing the music also may influence the performance. Similarly, the dependent variable. So he is going to measure only the task performance in the intentionally, but unintentionally, these three variables may influence the task performance. For example, employee tiredness, employee motivation, job satisfaction. If you have the good satisfaction, damn sure the task performance may be good. If you're not having the job satisfaction, what it happened, the final result, the task performance wise is not be good. This also causes. Yes, now I move to the, the types of external variable. It may be demand characteristics. I already uh, give some example. Um, based on this only, I made this kind of compilation like a demand characteristics, the experimental or investigator effect, participants variable and situation variables. These are things may come under the external variable. Now I'm moving to the measuring variable. These things, uh, we're talking about the uh, quantity data analysis. We are much focused in this one. One is called nominal, ordinal, interval ratio. This is called as a uh, levels of measurement. Normally, the nominal variable, we may treat all the demographic variable as a categorical variable. The ordinal, it may be satisfied the quantity as well the order. The interval may satisfy the quantity, order, and the equal intervals. The ratio. It's one more adding that's called absolute zero. So normally for the first two is made treated as a uh, qualitative uh, variable. The last two we may treated as a quantitative variable. Then the composite variable, it represent uh, 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 created by comparing two or more individual variables called indicated in three single variables. For example, uh, Better example, I'm giving as an example, think of the indicator as a pieces of a puzzle that must be fit together to see the big picture. So in the case of the, when you're doing the um, factor analysis, suppose I'm doing factor analysis, there's a 70 statement. All the 70 statement uh, after doing a confirmative or explanatory factor analysis, it may come, uh, it may be, what is that, company into two or three components or five components. That kind of component uh, based we are compiling the the item, uh, you are compelling the items of the, the, the particular uh, variable uh, into company, you are compelling some kind of grouping. So that is called as a composite variable. Normally we are using as a factor as we are using. So this kind of composite variable, we want to be selected before, uh, what is that, for doing the, uh, um, uh, for going for the data collection. Doing the analysis stage only, we can do this kind of, we can be divide the composite variable based on the needs of the research. That is called composite variable. So thank you. So hopefully you may understand the different types of um, variables.
yes yes sir thank you very much for your uh, very uh, lucid information and a clear presentation through your various gif images we are so happy to uh, we have listened to you and the researchers are benefited with your clear presentation thank you once again for your amazing presentation sir thank you thank you so after identification of the research problem the next step is to formulate the hypothesis hypothesis is the basis for scientific inquiry a well stated hypothesis must be testable within the reasonable period of time says l r gay here we have dr usha a retired professor who is there to explain clearly to the research community mm. through her rich experience to the research scholars the research scholars academic experience we can never buy from the shop so utilize the rich experience of dr usha to ask all your doubts and listen carefully to her presentation ma'am you are welcome thank you alma can you thank hear you. yes ma'am okay okay so uh, the topic that has been allotted to me is hypothesis in research so in the previous series we have discussed about identification of the problem the we know the different steps of scientific research so the first step is identification of the problem then we have the definition of key terms then next comes the formulation of hypothesis so when you are able to identify a problem and when it is clearly been defined when it is easy for formulate hypothesis so uh, hypothesis we have to discuss about the area hypothesis now what is meant by hypothesis it's it's a, a common term that is being used by researchers so uh, let me start from a, a simple life experience so we have a problem in a research also we have a research problem in the life situation also i would like to take a problem that is the uh, room in which you are working the fan is not working so the fan is not working is the real problem so what will you do for that so immediately after finding that the fan is not working what you will do is you will see whether power supply is there or not so that is a type of formulation of hypothesis so you know that from your knowledge so from theory or from your experience or what elders say you know that for rotating the fan you need electricity so first thing you will see is whether power supply is there or not so with that we are making a prediction so uh, the fan is not working so for that we are trying to find an answer we are trying to predict that since there is no electricity the fan is not working otherwise the fan is not working even though the electricity is there then again next thing if there is electricity and still the fan is not working again we will go for we will check the switch or the regulator so why are we are searching for the regulator because we know that there may be some problem so that also we will be getting from our knowledge from our previous experiences we have an idea that when the regulator is not in a position or when there is something wrong in the switch it will not work so that's also helps you to formulate a hypothesis so you will be hypothesizing it is due to the uh, fault in the switch or the regulator both are okay the regulator as well as the switch is okay but still the fan is not working then again you will be formulating a hypothesis it may be something wrong with the capacitor so again what you will do is you will be checking the capacitor so the scientific knowledge or the theories or the uh, previous experiences or what elders talk with you that helps you to formulate certain answer to your question so your question is why it's not working so you try to find out these uh, so, uh, solutions so you are testing each of the solution and try to find the answers so from that simple uh, example we can move to the concept of hypothesis so what's a hypothesis hypothesis is a tent 
tentative statement about the solution of the problem. So it's a tentative, means it's not uh, te only temporary that needs verification. So that's why we call it as a tentative statement. So always hypotheses are written in the statement form. So it is a tentative statement about the solution of a problem. So in order to solve the problem, we are uh, with the evidences, available evidences, we are formulating certain tentative assumptions. So with the assumptions, we have to test it. Then we can also tell it as it's a tentative explanation of the relationship between two or more variables. We know that in a, especially in educational studies, there may be variables. So in the previous session also, you have heard about the variables. There are independent variables, dependent variables. Mostly independent variables will be affecting the dependent variable. So when we want to relate that, again, we will be giving a tentative explanation to, the, to relate those two. Why? Because we want to solve the problem. And for that, to test that, whether it is a reason. So we are making some prediction in order to find out the solution to the problem. Actually, hypotheses are just a prediction to find out the solution of the problem. It's also known as a shrewd guess. It's a guess or an inference or a supposition about the research outcome based upon available evidence. So based upon, simply we cannot formulate hypothesis. Based upon the available evidence only, we can formulate the hypothesis. So that available evidence we will be getting from various sources. So with that available evidence, we try to make certain guesswork. And our duty is to test whether our guess is correct or not. And it's also defined as a intelligent guess or prediction that gives direction to the researcher. So the researcher, after formulating the hypothesis, he may have uh, information that after framing the objectives, he will have an idea. So this hypothesis formulation is uh, uh, done using the your objectives you have already formulated the objectives research objectives and those research objectives will help you to formulate hypothesis so it only thing is it's an intelligent guess with the unknown things and known things you are trying to formulate certain guesswork and that may be probable answer to a research problem now coming to the uh, next aspect that is how hypotheses are derived. So every researchers are uh, in a confusion that how hypotheses can be derived. So it can be derived inductively from observations. So we will be observing many things. So the, our observations are so specific situations. From the specific situations, we can come to the. So for example, we can see that educated parents students scores high. So from that, we can assume that. Maybe the parental involvement in studies may be the reason for uh, high scores of in, for, uh, the students. So we can frame a hypothesis based upon that. Parental involvement increases students' test scores. So inductively, from simple examples, from simple observations, we try to formulate certain solutions that is uh, 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 will be helping you to solve the problem. Then deductively also. So from theories also, deductively, it will help us to formulate hypothesis. We have many theories, such as learning theories, motivation theories. So, so many theories are there in education. So these theories also, that uh, while, uh, while conducting research, we conduct review of literature. So the conceptual framework for all the variables, we try to find out the conceptual framework of the variables. So while the conceptual or the theoretical knowledge help us to form deductively formulate hypothesis. So hypothesis can be formulated deductively also. So we have seen that study habits has significant relation with academic achievement. That's a hypothesis. So from the learning theories, we may have formulated such hypothesis. So from deductively also, hypothesis can be formulated. And next thing is research questions. So actually, the explanation to the research questions can be the hypothesis. So from research hypothesis helps us to formulate hypothesis. So hypothesis can be derived from inductively from observations or deductively from the already established theories or from research questions that research questions are formulated based upon our objectives. So this helps us to formulate the hypothesis. Now based upon that many definitions have been done. So Howard's hypothesis, Good and Hack has defined that it's a proposition which can be put to test 
to determine its validity. So there is difference between assumptions and hypothesis. Assumptions are also statement, but there is no scientific proof for that. Whereas hypothesis, hypothesis uh, condition is that it has to be tested. It has to be proved. When hypothesis is tested and proved, when it is continuously, it is repeated, same results we are getting, it helps us to formulate theories. So hypothesis are formal statements of the tentative or expected prediction or explanation of the relationship between two or more variables in a specified population. So it's a prediction. After all, hypothesis, we are not sure about the result. We are predicting the answer based upon what are evident. So with the evidences, we are trying to predict the answers to your research questions or objectives. So that's hypothesis. Now, next, we shall also see the importance of hypothesis. Uh, researchers, researchers are confused whether hypotheses are necessary for all researchers. So it's not, there is no hard and fast rule that there is uh, necessary for uh, formulate hypotheses for all types of research. For descriptive studies, there is no need for formulating hypotheses. Whereas for experimental or when we are using statistics or quantitative, mostly the quantitative type of research, that's a must that we have to formulate hypotheses. But in uh, most of the qualitative type of research as well as exploratory research when we are factual fi fact finding research fact finding research also there is no need for formulating hypothesis so we have to see in those cases we have our research questions that is also a tool in order to find your answers so research questions are also tools as well as hypothesis are also tools in order to find answer to a research problem so now let's see what are the importance of hypothesis. It provides clarity to the research problem and research objective. So there we are trying to predict the research answer or objective in terms of hypothesis. So that's why when we are framing the hypothesis, it gives clarity to the research problem as well as the objective. So based upon the objective, we are formulating the hypothesis. So that's the important. If the objective, what is our objective? We have to see what are our objectives. Based upon the objective, we have to formulate the hypothesis. It helps to translate the research problem and the objectives into clear explanation. So we are relating what is our research problem, what are the objectives, and we are trying to give explanation using the hypothesis. It relates logically known facts to intelligent guess about unknown condition, which leads to making of theories that already we discussed. So it, from the available evidences, it tries to catch many things and it relates and it helps us to lead to, it helps to lead, uh, making theories. Then it enables to relate theory to observations and observations to theory. So hypothesis, through the hypothesis, we'll be relating inductively or deductively, we will be relating the statements. It gives direction to the design of the study, collection, as well as interpretation of data. So formulation of the objective itself gives an idea or a direction to the design. So hypothesis formulation also helps us to what design we have to use. So in some hypothesis, it may be sometimes experimental, sometimes it may be survey type, sometimes it may be historical. So what type of data we have to collect, what type of interpretation we have to give, such things are also evident when we are framing the hypothesis or the research questions. It serves as a framework for drawing conclusions of the study. So the indispensable research instrument, hypothesis are indispensable research instruments. With that, we get a direction in which way we have to move because already we have intelligent we have made intelligent guess and the guess whether it is true or false we have to check so that's why it's told it is a indis indispensable research instrument it's a pathfinder for a researcher because you have after going through the review of related literature you have a lot of information theoretical knowledge as well as the research findings of other researchers so you have a lot of information and with that information with the available literature, you try to formulate certain predictions. So that predictions are the pathway, pathfinder for the researcher. So that gives the direction. So in that direction, so our, uh, in the scientific research, hypothesis testing is main. So uh, when we are able to 
uh, formulate hypothesis or research questions almost half the work has to be done then the next part is test the hypothesis and say whether it is correct or not or true or false or whether it has been accepted or rejected so such things will be done in a research work and this hypothesis helps us to formulate such things now i have said simply we cannot formulate hypothesis so we have many sources for formulating hypothesis so hypothesis in order to formulate hypothesis our basic step is we have to review the literature so the theoretical or conceptual framework that is our main source of formulation of the hypothesis we cannot make hypothesis in contradiction to the already proved theory or there may be laws theories etc so in uh, in the in contradiction to that theoretical aspect we cannot uh, frame hypothesis so the theoretical knowledge the concept that we have for, uh, obtained that is a source for formulating hypothesis then previous research findings so previously researchers have uh, found research findings and in that they have uh, uh, given many research results so that results also gives an idea how we have to formulate our hypothesis so that previous research findings at what others have done the results gives an intention or an idea how we can formulate hypothesis then real life experiences real life experiences also from our experience we learn a lot of things from our uh, elders from our parents teachers experts or from our real experiences we get a lot of things uh, as experiences and these experiences help us to formulate hypothesis with the knowledge that we get from the real experience we try to formulate hypothesis how we find in the real experience so we try to accept it and formulate hypothesis based upon that academic literature academic literature that books journals and the academic aspect that all we get from uh, reviewing that also helps us to formulate so we will be getting many things from the journals uh, education indexes so many uh, uh, books and academic literature so that also that information helps us to formulate uh, researchable hypothesis then our cultural heritage from our culture so based upon the culture that we are following so in each place the cultural there is difference in culture so that cultural heritage in one place the situation is in one way in the other place in uh, western countries the cultural pattern is different from ours so the our cultural heritage also helps us to formulate hypothesis then analogies analogies means in one situation you have found the results like that so how whether this is applicable in our situation also we try to formulate analogies and try to find out hypothesis based upon so we are making predictions formulating hypothesis means we are predicting certain uh, statements so then we have to test it then our deduction so our thinking process our deductive thinking process also helps us to formulate hypothesis so such and such is the condition so why in our uh, situation whether it is correct or not we have to check so for that you will be predicting certain things and you will be trying to find out a solution for that then internet from the computer you will be getting many sources from the medias you will be getting many informations and those informations also help us to formulate hypothesis we will be searching that literature in, in the literature review itself it, the internet is also coming so from that uh, internet sources also we will be getting idea what has been done by other researchers what are the uh, new in uh, developments in different disciplines so that also helps us to formulate hypothesis coming to the uh, characteristics of a good hypothesis a good hypothesis means it has to follow certain so all things all the predictions that cannot be taken uh, granted as hypothesis so a good hypothesis means it should have an explanatory power explanatory power means it should be in a position to explain what it is actually meant for so the explanatory power a, a good hypothesis should have explanatory power it should be in a position to explain what it actually means then next one is about the conceptual clarity the, the theoretical orientation should be there so the concept should be clear while formulating the hypothesis uh, the concept should be clear vaguely it has not it never we have to formulate the hypothesis the next one is about the testability we have to test it so hypothesis means the one of the characteristics of hypothesis it it can be testable 
So testability is one of the characteristics of hypothesis. So by collecting the data, we try to test it whether our uh, uh, predicted or ten formulated tentative uh, statements are correct or not. So that's why it's testability. Next one is objectivity, very objectively. So it has to be objectively, very specific. So subjectivity element should not be interfered in the uh, hypothesis. Only one aspect. So by framing the hypothesis, objectives can be uh, in the previous series, you have seen that there may be main objectives as well as subsidiary objectives. So the main objects, we, we should know what is the main objective. So subsidiary objectives, what are they? So hypothesis, when we are listing, we have to specify each one. So in objectives, sometimes we can write in a combination, but hypothesis very specific and separately we have to write. So objectively, it has to be good. The next one is about specificity. Specificity means specific, limited in scope, and must be very specific. So each one, we have to test one by one. And we have to see whether it is acceptable or it, whether we have to be rejected. So all hypothesis should be specifically written. So the statements that we are formulating based upon our evidence, that should be very specific. Each one, there should not be complication. So complex sentences should not be included in while formulating hypothesis. The next one is about relevance. So the relevant things only the relevant thing has to be written as statement in the hypothesis when unrelevant when unrelevant things should not be included when there is a conflict between uh, when we are formulating hypothesis it should not conflict with the laws of nature like that it should be relevant then consistency it should be consistent with the existing body of knowledge it should not be uh, a contradiction to the previously or well established theories laws hypothesis etc it should not be in a contradiction to that then simplicity it should be simple the word should be simple lucid and in clear way it has to be written the next one is about verifiability the hypothesis when we are formatting it should be verifiable we have to see that it can be verified so verifiability is also a characteristic of good hypothesis we have to test it and vary so validity has to be established then only the hypothesis we can accept or reject so that's why Verif verifiability is also a characteristic of research hypothesis. Then next aspect there is uh, types of hypothesis. There are different types of hypothesis. So hypothesis, as already said, it's a answer to the, it's a tentative answer to our research questions. So hypothesis can be of different types. So depending upon the nature of the problem, the hypothesis may be varying. Some hypotheses are simple, some are complex, some are associative in nature, some are causal hypothesis, some are directional hypothesis, some non-directional hypothesis, some are null hypothesis, some are alternative. So that can be framed according to our objective. So what's our objective? We have to see. It is very particular that what are objective. The researcher should be very familiar with the objective. So in order to achieve the objective, what I have to do, the researcher has to plan. So sometimes the hypothesis will be only simple one. So we will see what simple hypothesis and what's complex hypothesis. Then you will understand. So simple hypothesis means there exists a relationship between two variables. So Thank you, ma'am, for your 
a presentation on the hypothesis. I hope I am audible for everyone. Yeah. Thank you for me for your excellent presentation, ma'am. Now it is the time for the research scholars to ask questions. Okay. So research scholars, if you have questions, you can ask questions one by one. Santosh, please. Yeah. Very good morning, ma'am. Uh, uh, good morning. Nice presentation that is uh, today also we have a great session for us. Uh, yeah. Actually, my question is, uh, um, to uh, Tiago, sir. Uh, um, uh, how we how we delimit uh, or delimit the variables in a study? Is it is it uh, is it the decision of the researcher or uh, sorry, one second, you can ask the same queries. I am not able to get it properly. Sandosh. Uh, yeah. Uh, the nice presentation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how we delimit the variables uh, for a study, particular study, whether it is the decision of um, a researcher or the review of related literature will provide such an uh, uh, such a help for delimiting the variables. Yeah, yeah. That is in the concern of the investigator one. That is why you are giving us an operation definition in your chapter. Okay. The operation variable operation definition of the key terms is talking about the variables only. Actually, focus on that one. So, but um, but uh, without the background, we could not be uh, delimited by variables. You have to properly uh, see the that uh, uh, review of later work. Then finally, the investigator can decision take a decision about the delimitations or delimited or variables and all. That is the uh, the investigator decision. Okay. And another query is whether all these variables uh, uh, has to be numerically converted uh, for analysis or for uh, or this is for experimental study alone. We are doing such an. Um, yeah, yeah, that good, good question. That is why there is a one more question also in the chat box. Uh, that is also talking about the, the variables, nominal, ordinary, interval ratio, whether we can adopt the, uh, uh, the all kinds of uh, uh, types of data, uh, data types into a variable. It's based on the title only. For example, I'm doing the relationship study between the rural and urban area, uh, or correlation study, uh, or I'm going to compare the two uh, different places, rural and urban area, with one specific variable. In this case, uh, the variable which I'm adopting is a rural urban is a categorical variable. So nominal, okay. But I'm going to measure as a continuous variable, like uh, uh, like for example, the achievement level of the students of the rural and the urban area. The achievement may be a uh, continuous variable. So there is no thumb roll. You can go with the, you can select the variable always in a continuous. Uh, it may be based on the study. You have to be uh, check properly. So it may be categorical. It may be a uh, continuous also. But in the case of the, if you uh, take the consideration of the experimental method. For example, uh, if the effectiveness of uh, multimedia package on the achievement. In this case, the uh, multimedia package, the teaching uh, techniques is there, no? The teaching techniques, you are going to treat one group as a kind of, what is that? Normal method, other group is a experimental method. So what it happened, this is called as a categorical variable. You are using the, the teaching strategies like a categorical, but you are going to measure as a, um, what is that? You are going to measure into the, uh, uh, Continuous variable. So this is based on the purely based on the topic only. So there is no thumb roll. You can go with only the continuous variable as you were study variable. Okay. One more query to Maria, ma'am. Uh, uh, yes, sir. Uh, uh, okay. Are we, are, uh, actually, you said about aims and objectives of uh, research. Uh, are we every research uh, thesis uh, are giving such an uh, such a term just like aims of the research uh, i didn't find in uh, the much thesis just like that aims of the research usually it is uh, treated as uh, just it is as it is given as a research question yes, normally yes, yes, yes. in educational research you give mm -hmm. the aim as a the main question mm -hmm. or the goal goal of research mm -hmm. so it means the same 
it is to reach the goal that's why i gave that uh, photograph of a bullseye and the target so you have a goal or a target and unless you aim correctly you can't reach that goal so aim is to reach the target so in education normally you give it as the research main research question or the goal but in all other subject researches we give it as aims and objectives thank you thank you nice uh we have questions from the chat box that is i'll just read out the question from the chat box while writing objectives uh, that is for maria ma'am can you explain with the example as to how how to start with the action verbs how to support or avoid extraneous variables in research i think the first okay. question can be for maria ma'am the second question for dr kia ho can you explain so, uh, with the example as to how to start with the action verbs okay now supposing i take a research question a research aim that is uh, you want to identify the effect of online education online teaching on children between 5 to 10 years what is the effect of online teaching for children between 5 to 10 years so which means you are going to study or you should be you'll be taking samples of uh, sample studies of students from different schools it may be in one city that is chennai if that is your aim and you will be trying to find out uh, what is their response if they are having some problems in the last 10 months have they become sick have they had nervous tensions etc so in order to find identify your samples first so you have to identify children in the age group so to identify the sample age group of students and divide them into groups of 5 to 7 years 7 to 10 years etc so to identify becomes the action verb then you can take to find out the health conditions of the, these students to find out becomes the action verb that is the action of that particular objective is to find out you can assess the damage that has occurred to the student are you able to follow so when you are using words like to find out to assess to identify to describe to identify the socio economic status of the parents of school children between sample children between 5 to 10 years to determine so these are all the words that we use based on the particular the subject so i've just given you one example so action words are so many to find out to describe to determine uh, to study to seek to measure to calculate so all these are words because it just speaks about an action action verb is nothing big it just says the action you are going to do for example i told you that an objective answers the question of how why what uh, where etc so when you say how you are going to do it you have to say i am going to find out i am going to explore i am going to uh, verify i am going to measure it i am going to calculate it i am going to describe it so the sentence must start with to describe to identify to verify to calculate so that is what we mean by an action verb okay so uh, that's a question uh, the second part of the question from krishnamini how to support or avoid the extraneous variable in research uh, suppose as a researcher you are measuring the extraneous variable we can be nullify the effect or uh, what is the we can keep the constant of the that particular extraneous variable with the use of the ancova techniques so that's you know analysis of covariance or the partial correlation we can adopt from this we can be eliminate the third variable effect like extraneous variable so i hope you are now we are getting the answer for this question okay good morning sir yes yes ma'am yes ma'am you are audible please why might the researcher want to use multiple dependent variables madam it's not compulsory to go with multiple dependent variable or multiple independent variable based on the research study so for example i am doing the uh, analysis i am doing the study like a mooc awareness 
MOOC perception on MOOC engagement. In this case, two independent variables I'm using, MOOC awareness and MOOC perceptions on the MOOC engagement. So based on the study only, we have to be find out that how many independent variables you are using, how many dependent variables you are using. If there is no thumb rule, you can go with multiple dependent variables. So based on the study, Based on the title of your research work, you can be fine. Like you can think. Uh, otherwise, we are, while you are doing the uh, what is that review of later literature research, after the reviews only you are going to finalize your topic. From the topic, you can be go with a n number of uh, independent variable or n number of dependent variable. That is the investigator vision. There is no thumb rule. You can go with the multiple dependent variable or multiple independent variable. In the case of the in, uh, experimental method, uh, some people are using a single independent variable, one dependent variable only. Okay, so based on the study only, it may be different. Okay. 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 What type of what type of scale is used for the variables, sir? Is it nominal, ordinal, interval, ratio? Is the variable categorical or continuous? And that is why, for the case of the variable, that's why once again, there's no thumb rule on it. Okay. Suppose you are going to the same thing, MOOC awareness or MOOC perception. I'm taking the two independent variable. Here, the two independent variable, both is a continuous nature. I'm going to measure the dependent variable MOOC engagement. That also is a uh, continuous variable. So, but this is one study. Suppose I'm going to check other study, like uh, uh, there is a comparative study of rural and urban area of the student's uh, level of achievement. In this case, uh, I am selecting the rural and urban as an independent variable. This is called categorical. I am going to measure the dependent variable as an achievement level of the, the two, uh, two part of the students. There is called uh, uh, continuous. So that is why this also it may be that uh, students concern or the investigative concern only. You can adopt uh, independent variable or dependent variable in any manner, even the categorical, even the continuous. There is no thumb roll on it. You can go with only the continuous variable. Okay. There is a question Thanks. from the Thanks. YouTube. Yeah. There is a question from the YouTube. Can research papers be in Tamil? I think yeah. anybody can answer. Yeah. If the journal uh, people are accepting, you can publish it. Okay. But normally, the journal is talking about uh, more, more, more or less the journal having the impact factor. Uh, that kind of things, once you write in the English only, you may get it. Okay, even the uh, H10 index and all. So if you publish the article in only the specific language, it may reach only the particular state only. It won't be go to the other countries and all. So there is a wish. If you are wish to publish in Tamil, you can publish. There is not an issue. But the journal paper, they may accept it. The editor can accept it in the sense, no problem. If, yes, if there is a vernacular journal that accepts, then you can. Normally, mm -hmm. Tamil literature, it is uh, all the publications are in Tamil only. Mm -hmm. So, in the local, in Tamil Nadu, supposing we have a uh, journal vernacular which provides vernacular articles, it can be. But normally, the rule is all research is done in English, where as far as our country is concerned. I don't know, ma'am, can Dr. Usha only, can highlight? <laughs> only Tamil Nadu people can refer to that journal. That's the <laughs> difficulty. Yeah. When others want to get the information from those articles, what to you do? Cannot. The, uh, so that's the uh, only problem. But you can publish for local publication. For Tamil Nadu people, you can uh, disseminate the knowledge through your articles. So when our knowledge sharing should be throughout to the world, it has to be in the language which is uh, readable by everyone. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, Alma, madam, I had problem with internet connectivity, so that's why I couldn't come to you. So yes, ma'am, I uh, it's okay. You understood. You understood. Okay. Yes, I understood. I understood. Okay. Okay. Uh, participants, any questions? Participants as well as uh, research uh, scholars. Yes. The difference yeah. between research question and hypothesis, ma'am. Ah, research questions and hypothesis, both are research tools. So they are uh, research questions will be in the question form. The difference form. between the research question and the... Ah, research yeah. questions will be in the question form. And that also expects certain results. Hypothesis are in the statement form. So that also predicts what is the probable relation or what, what is the probable difference or what is the uh, actual association. So that 
in order to exhibit that we formulate hypothesis so both are research tools in so most of the qualitative type of research we go for research questions and exploratory research descriptive one as well as fact finding things we go for research questions whereas in other type experimental research or some quantitative type of research we go for hypothesis so hypothesis also both are giving a direction in order to go how to proceed with the research yes sir thank you ma'am uh, and also how to write a research objectives for a research proposal ma'am it is it follows the same pattern for theses but in a proposal your uh, main focus will be on the yes. title the research question main question or the goal that is the aim the objectives only the main one or two objectives can be highlighted it is not essential that you have to spell out all your objectives in a research proposal research proposal expects more of the title the uh, conceptual background and the need for that study why we are doing it the research methodology what you are going to use the analysis you have to uh, explain that and research aim and objectives aim has to be written or it's a main question or the goal but the objectives just a few or one objective or two objectives can be written even if you don't write an objective for a proposal it is okay but the aim or the question is essential thank you ma'am yes alag raja do you have any questions hello Then one more. Can you can you explain you what any... is? Huh? Can you ex? Can you explain what is? Yes, you are audible. Statistical hypothesis, something. Ah, null hypothesis can also be called as statistical hypothesis. That is it audible? Is yes, it audible? Yes, yes, yes. Ah, yes. Null hypothesis can also be called as statistical hypothesis. In null hypothesis, in order to verify that, we use uh, statistical procedures. It, uh, we uh, in null hypothesis we say no there the, it's no hypothesis we can say null hypothesis and no hypothesis so we uh, say that it's due to some error and not in especially in experimental type of research when we are going for 100% objectivity there may be errors so there we try to formulate null hypothesis so in uh, testing the statistical hypothesis or null hypothesis we use statistical analysis so there we level of significance we try to find whether to accept or reject we are deciding based upon the level of significance so statistical so procedure is used almost all the null hypothesis is statistical in nature is it yes almost all the is it mandatory to have hypothesis for all the objectives ah uh, no is it mandatory no, to have no no it's not yes, mandatory that all hypo, all uh, problems have um, uh, hypothesis in some i have said that in quantitative type of research so based upon your problem that is has to be decided so quantitative type of research there is a must that we have to use uh, hypothesis whereas in qualitative type of research we have to for example historical type of research there we are trying to find the history history that may be past one or we want to add something with the present situation so in that type of research we need only research questions there is no need for conducting uh, making hypothesis for historical type of research or some fact finding type of research we need not prepare uh, hypothesis in those cases research questions will be enough so we know the objectives and what uh, substitute for that so what are the things that we want to collect based upon that we have to decide whether to formulate hypothesis or uh, research questions so there is it's not mandatory that all research uh, problems should have research uh, hypothesis or research hypothesis thank you ma'am and also how many objective uh, thesis should have ma'am there is no hard and fast rule in uh, preparing uh, objective you you should be very uh, particular in knowing about what is the purpose of your study that is the aim what is the major aim of your study the purpose should be the from the title itself from the research title itself it should be clear what is the purpose of the study so in order to achieve that purpose we are formulating certain hypothesis or objectives 
so the object is in order to achieve the object is what are the things needed based upon that we have to decide how many object is we have to formulate there is no hard and fast rule that uh, five numbers or 10 numbers should be there so in when uh, for valuation and all many theses are coming from tamil nadu especially we used to comment that there are so many high uh, objectives so 60 up to 60 numbers of objectives we have seen so there is no with the demographic variable itself they will be formulating so many hypotheses there's no need for formulating such when it is relevant when the demographic variable is relevant we can formulate objective or hypothesis with that when it is not relevant in order to increase the number of objectives some people used to prepare so many objectives that is not necessary so there is no, based upon your purpose or what is your objective that decides how many objectives you have to formulate thank you ma'am and also how to formulate a reject uh, research objectives how to formulate research objectives ma'am formulate an objective you should understand your aim and how you are going to reach that aim how you are going to reach the end of that research like i told you if an example is if you want to study about uh, dyslexic children in schools a study on uh, what are the problems of dyslexic, uh, dyslexic children then you have to find out if the school has identified you have to go step by step so we are first taking to identify the, the schools where dyslexic children are studying and then to find out or to assess whether the dyslexic children are given special attention in class or not so that the next step and then are they faring yeah. how are they performing the third one will be according to their academic performance what is the result of their academic performance of dyslexic children compared to the other children so we go like this step by step so whatever so this is how and i told you that you start with the action work the statement it's nothing but the statement has to start with an action so you're going to find out most of it is step by step finding out so that ultimately all the objectives together will give you the answer for your aim or your goal it gives you the complete answer for your the aim with which you started to do your research Usha, ma is, that, is there uh, anything that you would uh, like to add uh, <laughs> because i was worried because uh, <laughs> uh, i couldn't complete so no problem uh, the research scholars are knowing that there are different types of hypothesis and they have asked questions also now hypothesis also known as statistical hypothesis then alternative hypothesis also known as research hypothesis that's all then uh, normally while formulating hypothesis we will be in a position to go to the research the design we can select after formulating the objectives as well as hypothesis we are in a position to formulate the design of the study how we have to go for data collection what are the tools that we have to use in order to collect the information what are the evidences that we have to collect and what are the if any statistical procedure is there what is the statistical procedure in order to uh, achieve the objective so each objective will be using different types of statistical procedures so what is the study for example if a relationship is we are finding then correlation uh, technique will be using so effect so many many things many uh, uh, statistical procedures are there depending upon the objective we have to decide which statistical procedure we have to utilize and uh, some uh, researchers are of uh, there is difference of opinion and they are stating why there is what is the need for research hypothesis so when the when there is uh, evident thing when the theories are uh, in, a, in a researchable form why we are going for null hypothesis so the, uh, the researchers may argue differently so there is difference of opinion among different researchers so that also we have to see one question from participants and um, which hypothesis better i mean research hypothesis or null hypothesis for experimental study oh, yeah. uh, for experimental study can you hear yes, yes ma'am yes ma'am for experimental study we prefer uh, null hypothesis and most of the works has been done uh, using uh, they are formulating null hypothesis but each have its own peculiarity 
for null uh, alternative hypothesis when things are evident there is no need to form no we cannot say no when it's evident there is no need for saying that there is no but in experiments especially when they want to say in, in an objective way so null hypothesis tries to say it is by chance the errors are occurring by chance when they want to say the chances they are going for null hypothesis so there are testing whether significant change is there or not significant so uh, it depends depending upon what we are trying to uh, find out we can use there is no hard and fast rule that only alternate hypothesis should be there that's why i was telling that there is difference of opinion among researchers some are going for null hypothesis formulating always null hypothesis then some are in favor of alternate hypothesis so there is no hard and fast if null hypothesis form and it is found significant whether accept or reject 100% true or false we cannot say so either accept or reject we can do it thank you thank you ma'am ma'am one more question if applicable how many levels and factors are mentioned in this study ma'am while doing research Pardon? while doing research pardon me how many levels and factors are mentioned while selecting the how many levels what is number what level objectives what level? and the aims how many objectives you are asking yes ma'am ah uh, that's what ma'am was just explaining there is no sometime back she explained that you don't need to uh, uh, find out how many objectives it depends on the need of the study so normally we say about 5 to 10 objectives it should be good because too many objectives makes the research more complicated it may there are many chances for you to mislead you but there are certain uh, studies where the data requires more number of objectives then it is permissible that you use more but try to uh, i mean restrict your objectives in such a way that it is actually a division of your aim your aim is divided into many parts of how you are going to do it so that you reach the final part so the restricted number of objectives that give you a holistic end is better it's not actually the number that matters but normally it is about 5 to 10 that is followed everywhere but i i told you in educational research more number of uh, i mean objectives are permissible you can use okay Thank you, ma'am. So, ma'am, Sandosh, Sandosh, any questions? Tell me. Yes, no. So we have come to the end of this session. Uh, I thank uh, Dr. Usha and Dr. Maria and Dr. Tiago for your excellent insights that was uh, shared uh, among the research scholars. You spared your valuable time to share your insights, ma'am. and he also answered all the questions uh, raised by the research scholars and i thank you once again for the same uh, let us go for the uh, uh, final session of vote of thanks jaba jaba yes ma'am am i audible yes yes you are audible yes jaba yes good afternoon to one and all on behalf of the management staff and students of stella martitono college of education i am happy to propose the vote of thanks for the panel discussion series 2 on educational research and statistics statistics focusing on aims and objectives variables and hypothesis my foremost gratitude to the lord almighty for his mighty guidance in the conduct of this panel discussion towards enriching the thirst for research i am extremely grateful to dr maria anita retired professor of nirmala college coimbatore for a clear deliberation on aims and objectives in the research field ma'am you differentiated between research aim and objectives in a novel manner with a spicy example in addition you clearly explained about the formulation of aims and also on the points to be points to be avoided while formulating them your valid points on framing aims and objectives for providing the direction of research value of research and usefulness for the society is certain to help the research scholars thank you anita ma'am 
Nextly, I record my heartfelt thanks to Dr. Thiagu, Assistant Professor, Central University of Kerala, for his valuable information on research variables. Sir, you have been a strong resource support in all the research programs organized in, the, in our institution. Thanks for helping in our research journey. Your crystal clear explanation on different research variables, namely independent variable, dependent variable, control variable, compounding variable, mediating variable, moderating variable, intervening variable, active variable, attribute variable, attribute variable and demographic, demographic variables with classification is certain to help the participants. Thanks a lot, sir. My special thanks to Dr. P. Usha, retired professor of Calicut University, for enlightening the participants on hypothesis in research. We are extremely grateful for your effective and exemplary explanation on the concept of hypothesis, the means of derivation of hypothesis from observation, theory, and research questions, the importance of hypothesis in research, and for giving a broad overview about the sources of hypothesis and its types and, and characteristics. Thanks a lot, Usha ma'am. I am thankful to all the resource persons for clarifying the various doubts of all the participants. Thanks a lot, all of you. I underline my thanks to our Riyadh Secretary, Reverend Sister Paul and Mary, for her encouragement and support in the conduct of the panel, panel discussion series. I am indeed grateful to our principal, Dr. Joseph Catherine, for a constant motivation and guidance towards this research discussion. I am thankful to our organizing secretary of this panel discussion series, Dr. Alma Juliet Pamina, for her initiative and meticulous planning towards conducting this plan towards conducting this panel discussion series on research. My words of gratitude is also for the research scholars who participated and interacted actively in this panel. My final final words of thankfulness is for the participants and research scholars for your active participation. Thank you, one and all. Over to Alma, ma'am. Yeah, thank you all. We have come to thank the you. end of the session. Thank you, Usha ma'am. Thank, thank you, Maria ma'am. Ma 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 and thank you, Dr. Thank Tarabu. you, Alma. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much. You spent your time, valuable time, preparing, uh, doing a lot of work for us, no? Uh, Welcome. Okay. Okay. So thank you, ma'am, Usha ma'am. Okay. We thank are enjoying it. So yeah. Okay, thank you. Bye. Bye, bye. Thank you, Usha, ma'am. Nice meeting you. Bye. Oh, okay. thank you. Thank you, Maria. <laughs> thank you. Nice meeting you all in this pandemic period like this, no? Yes. Shall we end? Ma'am, how are you? Uh, Maria, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I am also, I am also okay. a little bit okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. No, you're looking a little better only. Yesterday, you sounded very...